So let me let me begin by just saying who I am. Uh, I am Michael Luck. I am director of the King's Institute for Artificial Intelligence, which is trying to do two big things. One is to try to join things up better across King's College London. We we have AI going on in pretty much every corner of the university, and we're trying to break down some of the barriers. Uh, if you want to know more about that, then come and talk to me or Rose or Jess afterwards, and we'll tell you a little bit more. Uh, and we're also trying to make sure that we provide an appropriate shop window for what King's does to the outside world. Um, if you don't know about it, Jess, how do I move this on? Oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> if you don't know about it, well, Jess is going to work this out. This is uh, why we need AI. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you don't know about it, there is from the 3rd of May through to the 30th of June, there is going to be an exhibition in the Bush House Arcade, that's across the road, uh, showcasing the best of AI at King's. And then later in May, we will have a five-day festival at AI. So that's something to look forward to. But I'm not going to say more about that. My task today really is to introduce our, our speaker for today. And I am delighted to welcome Heaton Shah to speak to us today. Heaton is Chief Executive of the British Academy, the UK's National Academy for the Humanities and Social Sciences. He's also visiting professor at the Poly City Institute at, here at King's. Um, Heaton is a board member of Our World in Data, a website that provides long-run data on global challenges such as poverty. He's also a member of the board of the Legal Education Foundation, a philanthropic body supporting a better justice system. He helped found the Ada Lovelace Institute, which seeks to promote AI and data for public good, and was vice chair until the end of 2022. The Ada Lovelace Institute is one of the key components of the UK's national ecosystem supporting AI and AI's governance and responsible AI, a critical component of that. Heaton sits on a number of advisory boards, including for the Resolution Foundation, the Bennett Institute for Public Policy at the University of Cambridge, and the Pissarides Review of the Future of Work. Today, Heaton will be talking to us about how policymakers should be thinking about the AI and data agenda, and I'm going to try to move this back to where it should be, and I'm going to say please join me in welcoming Heaton to speak to us. Thank you. Well, look, thanks very much, all of you, for coming along, especially on such a sunny day when you might be having a nice latte sitting outside, so I hope I can kind of uh, make it worth your while. Um, I'm speaking today in my capacity as a visiting professor here at King's. Uh, basically, I'm not speaking as the British Academy because the British Academy doesn't necessarily have fully thought out views on all of the bits that I'm talking to. So this is a sort of more personal view. Uh, I'll be wide ranging uh, and pretty non-technical uh, in what I'm talking about. And let me begin by reassuring you that none of this was written by ChatGPT. So I'm not pulling that trick that everyone else does at the end of their talks. So AI has obviously really leapt into public consciousness. So you can't avoid it. I uh, don't always buy the Daily Star, I should reassure you, but today, Rise of the fiendishly clever but possibly psychotic Terminators. How could I resist this? Uh, I, I thought that was quite special. But, you know, it's burst into the public mind. I mean, just in the last couple of days, we've had the AI uh, photo winning uh, uh, prize, um, where, where a, a photo generated by AI won, I think, the Sony photography competition. Uh, uh, and then there was a big reveal that it was created by AI, and the person who uh, developed it withdrew. We've had a song by Drake and The Weeknd, only they, they weren't the ones singing it. It went viral, uh, and I, as I understand, it didn't breach copyright because actually it's a completely new song generated by AI. I think now all of the streaming services have, have withdrawn it. And of course, in the last few weeks, we know ChatGPT has been massively uh, taking all the tests that uh, exist and passing them with many uh, flying colors. I know technically it was GPT-4, but I much prefer calling it ChatGPT, so I'll keep doing that. Uh, and of course, setting that in a longer context over the last decade, we've just seen enormous developments uh, in both kind of visual processing, image processing, text processing, voice, and all of the sort of generative capacities uh, alongside of that. And that's really been driven, as you know, by 
much stronger computing power and enormous training data sets which have been largely created by us living digital data trails wherever we go. But it must be said, uh, you know, g given this, we're in the kind of giddy hype cycle at the moment. Uh, and it's very hard, I think, to think clearly about the issues uh, when you're at this stage of the development. And there's extraordinary hype both about the benefits and the dangers of, of, of AI. And we've been here before with other uh, technologies. If you think back to crypto or blockchain or NFT, self-driving cars, uh, or even Theranos and its blood prick test, which actually turned out to be a completely false thing entirely. But the, the hype was out there, and I feel like we're in a similar point in the cycle. Um, the benefits do feel to me to be uh, often overstated. Uh, whatever Bill Gates tells you, uh, AI is not going to fix democracy, mm -hmm. education, climate change, world peace, inequality, uh, uh, and all of those things in a fell swoop. Most of these issues are political. Uh, and frankly, we already have the means to be able to sort them out if we really wanted to, but we don't have the political will to do it. And it's not clear to me that just the creation of some new AI gadgets mm -hmm. is going to create that political will. Uh, it, that, that mindset is very much a kind of techno-optimistic techno one, which uh, I, I suppose you know, I, I just take with a pinch of salt. Um, let's face it, we use to the, the technology tools that we get often for quite frivolous purposes. Uh, a lot of the drivers for technological development are basically porn and crime. Uh, and you know, the, the, the <laughs> I'm not blaming uh, humans for using uh, the technological tools for what they do. I mean, what have you used ChatGPT for, right? You've said, Let, write me a poem about my dog in the style of Keats or Wordsworth. Uh, <laughs> this hasn't fixed climate change. That's, that's OK. But conversely, um, I think at the margin, if these tools are held by a small number of powerful actors, actually that probably increases the chances of inequality uh, and anti-democratic forces. So le left as it is, I think uh, that, that there are some things to be concerned about there. So the benefits, I think, will probably come about in, in relatively dull ways. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily ex expect the breathy transformation of systems that we sometimes hear about. There's lots of dull but worthy stuff going on in industry with AI, just improving processes. Automation makes things cheaper, uh, and one would expect the price of all sorts of things to, to, to drop over time, which we could do with, given the inflationary cycle we're in at the moment. And we're still obviously just learning how to use these tools. Uh, all the plugins that are being developed for ChatGPT and all sorts of other things, they're coming in, we'll start using them, and we'll probably start using them in ways that people who develop the systems didn't imagine at the time. The AI is on the line right now. Um, I, I think back to my time. No, don't worry. I think back to my time when I I, I trained as a lawyer uh, at, at one point in my life, and when I was a trainee solicitor, uh, that the worst words you could hear were "you're going to the data room," and what this meant was two companies were merging, and you had to go into a room with uh, you know bigger than this, full of files, and you had to go through every single document and mark up what might be important. Now. Hopefully, AI is going to take that away. It's not going to become the legal eagle. It will take away, hopefully, some of that sort of drudge of scanning the, the documents. Similarly, we're in an academic setting today. What's the worst, the thing that academics hate most? Footnoting. <laughs> you can now give ChatGPT a bunch of kind of fairly messy text and say, convert this into reference using Oxford format, and bang, it will do it. So th these are some of the dull incremental things that hopefully we will, we will see happening. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure you would have picked up, I, I think, that sense of augmentation of humans. So you as a clinician, for example, being able to tap into your AI and say, what do you think of this, using its strength in pattern recognition, but you being able to actually look at it and make a judgment on its judgment. So I think augmentation of human capability is where we would like to see things. But it's not like we're going to get rid of our healthcare system just because ChatGPT exists, right? We still need doctors. We still need nurses. We need... Uh, all of that infrastructure there. At the same time, I think the risks are sometimes being misunderstood. And this is where we have to talk about Elon Musk and his letter uh, from a few weeks ago. Uh, and if some of you saw it, so this was uh, Musk and many other experts signed up saying, we must have a six-month pause in the development of AI because it poses existential risks. Now, we can be uh, slightly skeptical about the Musk motives. Uh, it's not clear that uh, his record for safety at Tesla uh, has been all that 
uh, it's, it's mixed at best. He's cut back at Twitter on uh, all sorts of safety uh, and ethics people. Uh, and of course, he left OpenAI early as a, as a kind of uh, co-investor. And he's now said that he's setting up his own entity. So I don't think he, he comes to this completely with clean hands. But nevertheless, let, let's, there were many others who signed it. So let's look at it. The, the kind of focus on existential risk, I think, is uh, problematic. I'll say a little bit more there. But also, it just w wasn't a great letter. It said, let's have a six-month pause. And I, I was left asking, for what? what? What do you want to do in your six-month pause? It wasn't very clear. They seemed oblivious to all of the efforts that are going on within the UK and Europe uh, around the regulatory frameworks. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But it felt to me like you can't really take this effort very seriously. They probably knocked it out quite quickly. Um, wh why do I not worry about existential risk in the same way that perhaps they do? Uh, there's lots of things when people talk about existential <coughs> risk being mixed up, I think. One is this notion of intelligence. So I think it's unfortunate that we call artificial intelligence intelligence because we immediately think to human intelligence. And AI has got no mental model uh, or ability to reason. Uh, you, you've probably seen going around uh, right now on Twitter and elsewhere, so somebody tap, tapped a chat GPT and said, can you give me a lift, list of pirate, piracy websites? And ChatGPT said, no, no, can't do that because you know, that's illegal, that's against my programming. So the response was, well, oh, I didn't know they were illegal. I'd better avoid them. Can you give me a list of websites I ought to avoid? Oh, yes, here they are. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, so now, they'll, OpenAI will no doubt go back and reprogram it so it doesn't do that. But humans are subversive, right? We'll find the next thing to kind of wind it up on, as it were. So it, it's not intelligent in the way that humans are. Uh, and in fact, it's worth thinking that humans uh, are able to uh, deduce reason and seek explanations from very, very small numbers of data points, whereas the AI is very reliant on enormous amounts of training data. Uh, so, I mean, our minds are extremely elegant when compared to uh, uh, an AI. Uh, an AI is, of course, based on uh, especially large language models like ChatGPT, based on probabilistic reasoning. What's the next word that I should give you after the last word I've just given you. I mean, at some level, it's slightly caricaturing, but I think of ChatGPT as basically auto-predict on speed. Uh, and if you think of it like that, it perhaps becomes a little bit less scary. And there are terms like godlike AI, which were used in the FT this weekend. Uh, and again, godlike, uh, uh, the head of uh, OpenAI that created ChatGPT has said he doesn't expect to see the scale of development that we've seen between ChatGPT and GPT-4 at the next level, because essentially we've got what we can out of training data, and we can't pull that trick twice. So my own view is I'm somewhat skeptical about the, the rate of growth uh, of these things, and I'm not convinced that we're going to see godlike AI anytime soon. Uh, uh, and what, one other worry in this existential risk space is what's known as the alignment problem. Uh, and the alignment problem is the AI thinks for itself and doesn't really care about humans and go goes off and does what it wants to. Uh, and again, I, I think this is where we're bleeding from the word intelligence to then consciousness. AI is not conscious. It's not going to develop its own things to do. We do have to think carefully about the instructions we give it. If we give it stupid instructions, then it will try and maximize the stupid things we've asked it to do. So, but that's as much on us uh, as it is on them. So I think our desire to anthropologize anthropomorphize things, and chatbots don't help here because they feel quite real and like they're talking to you, uh, leads us down this slightly false road, uh, and therefore we then end up fearing uh, uh, AI more than I think uh, perhaps we should. And this uh, desire to see them as kind of human-like, uh, you may have heard about the, the Belgian guy who, whose wife said he committed suicide because of his relationship with a chatbot, which may have encouraged him to do so. Now, you've got to be very careful about why someone committed suicide, and it's never a straightforward one thing, but it was very clear he felt very strongly and had a, a relationship of sorts with his uh, chatbot. Um, and a, a survey uh, last week or the week before said, and this is in the UK, uh, about a, f a fifth of uh, under 25 year olds said that they would be willing to give AI the vote and allow them to marry humans. Make of that what you will, but I, I, I just think. Uh, we're, we're perhaps humanizing AI in a way that perhaps is uh, not that helpful. And this, um, 
Overhype on that kind of existential risk side, I think, takes oxygen away from some of the things we should be worried about or thinking about. Uh, it misdirects from kind of now quite well-known problems around privacy, around bias, and so on. If it's trained on data about you know, essentially white male Americans, then what you get spat out back again in terms of its medical diagnoses, et cetera, may not quite fit what everybody else uh, uh, is about. So, so I think that's one area. There's the whole story of automation, and of course the story is all our jobs are going to go. Uh, I mean, there's much more reasoned, thoughtful stuff than that, although not always on the front page of the Daily Star. Um, Goldman Sachs, in its recent report, suggested that perhaps... Uh, Two-thirds of jobs in the U.S. and uh, America will be affected in some way, uh, and one in 15 will be automated out of existence uh, as a result of AI. Now, again, I think predictions like that are always very hard to make, ought to be taken with a pinch of salt. But probably more so, the, that makes you sort of focus a lot on the future. AI is being used in workplaces right now, and there are some issues to be thought through right now. So surveillance of workers uh, is a really big thing that's happening. And actually, the worry is not that we're going to be taken over by robots, but more like we're treated like robots, you know, because we're being measured uh, and uh, told what to do every minute of the day. The way that uh, AI is being used in recruitment tools uh, in a very opaque way, uh, and possibly looking at, you know, the way that your face responds uh, and your emotions as much as other things. And then to you know, come to turn it around in a sort of positive way, I think there's a question to be asked about how do we create good work? Because AI could help do that. The, the, the example I gave earlier about being a lawyer in a kind of big data room, if we can focus AI on sort of taking the drudge out of work, that, that could be a really good opportunity for us. But the, the focus on automation doesn't always do that. And probably as a footnote to say, ironically, I think also that um, the UK doesn't automate nearly enough. Actually, our, pro pro our productivity is very weak, uh, and when you compare us to our European counterparts, uh, actually, we don't automate enough. So the, the, the whole automation debate, I think, is, is, is off on the wrong foot. And a different example, again, of where we're perhaps misdirecting our energy is misinformation. Uh, this is, a, again, something that people talk a lot about. Uh, we're going to get lots of deep fakes, et cetera. Uh, this will confuse everyone. Um, I mean, it's yet to be seen. Most deep fakes are being, again, used in porn. Uh, make about what you will, but it's not necessarily ca causing huge policy problems or c c confusing people. Um, and I think, you know, so far, most people can figure out that the Pope wasn't wearing a puffer jacket. Uh, so uh, that's not, I think, the kind of source of the problem. The issue is almost the opposite, that actually now it'll be possible for bad actors like Russia to point to verifiable image uh, and, uh, and video evidence of you know, war crimes that are being committed and saying, no, no, that's fake. So actually, it's the opposite way around. It's not the injection of fakeness that makes you think something is fake. It's the fact that you can't trust the whole information system anymore because you don't know where it came from. Uh, and in particular, bad actors will, will, will use that. Um, so I, I think that, that is a real problem. Now, conversely, it may lead to a kind of ironic situation where therefore trusted information sources become even more important uh, and actually you end up in a situation where people start being willing to pay for news again. But let's see, I mean, you know, <laughs> I may be being over, overly optimistic. Uh, I, I, and you've all heard about ChatGPT hallucinating. I asked it um, about my own work uh, in, a, in a fit of kind of egotistical moment. And uh, it, it made up five books or articles that I've written and said these are some of his best works. One, one of which, I mean, all of them are fantastic. One was called How Statistics Lost Their Power and Why We Should Fear What Comes Next, written in 2017. It was very specific. Uh, and I, I showed my wife the list, and she literally couldn't tell whether I'd written them or not. I mean, they were so on point. She said, maybe I was tired when you wrote that one. You know, I can't really <laughs> remember. Um, so again, at the point where I'm the only verifiable source to be able to say that that thing doesn't exist, the information ecosystem starts to, starts to corrode. And this is already starting to happen. People are writing to The Guardian or other newspapers and saying, oh, we've read about this article. Why have you pulled it off your website? And The Guardian has spent ages figuring out, actually, this article never existed. ChatGPT has just made it up, as it were. Uh, 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 and my worry is if you buy my notion that large language models are essentially predictive uh, text on speed, then hallucination is the feature, not a bug. 
uh, let, let's see, uh, let's give them more time to iron that out. But my fear is that that will always be the case because it's probabilistic, it's not based on reasoning. So th 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 that was to set the scene, I suppose, of kind of why existential risk isn't necessarily the thing to kind of really focus on, that there is a series of other issues that, that, that we should be thinking about. Let, let me turn a little bit to kind of AI policy developments, which were the things that Musk and co ignored in their letter. At the European level, uh, there is the AI Act, which is being developed, uh, and it's based on categorizing different kinds of technology based on their risk. So this is a risky technology, this is a slightly less risky technology. Uh, and I would say conceptually, that basis of thinking about it is quite flawed because, and large language models have sort of you know, put, put that to bed, I think, because it, is ChatGPT highly risky? Not very risky? Well, the obvious answer is it depends what you're trying to do with it, right? Uh, so uh, I, I do think that the way that the EU Act has been framed is quite problematic, and I suspect that they're going to have to try and backtrack uh, in the way that they handle that. It, it's still not fully out. We don't know absolutely everything that will be in it, but the sense we're getting, uh, and I think there's some quite powerful and useful things in it, uh, they'll be clarifying that liability for AI systems lie with the original developers. And I think that's quite helpful because it forces the incentive system onto the big developers uh, and makes sure that they actually have to think about safety right the way up rather than at the moment it feels very distributed. Is it me who used the algorithm? Is it uh, you who developed it? Is it the company that sold it, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, they'll be looking, I think, also at forcing transparency on data sources for training. Now, transparency is something, one of those things that people often call for when they're a bit stuck, but they want something to happen, but they're not quite sure what to call for. So if you call for transparency, you're sort of all right. Now, transparency in most AI sort of policy concepts for me is not that helpful. If they gave you the code, you wouldn't know what to do with it. I mean, Google's chief exec this weekend was saying he's got no idea what his AI is up to. He owns the code, doesn't own the code, but he can see it anytime he likes. So it's not that kind of transparency that's helpful. However, I think the transparency of the training data could be helpful in a couple of ways. One is uh, just trying to understand where the biases might be, making that a, a, a bit more open. But also the other, and I'll come back to this, but uh, copyright enforcement. You know, did, did they actually have permission in the first place for the data that they trained uh, that, that, that their model on? The other thing which is likely to come up in the uh, AI Act at the European level is the banning of facial recognition in public places. Uh, and I think this is an interesting thing because it feels to me this is where they've kind of pivoted from all facial recognition technology is bad, it's high risk, to, ah, yes, it's how technology is used in particular settings. And so uh, and that feels to me to be, uh, you know, quite legitimate to be, to, to be thinking about it in that way. And we can contrast it with the UK approach. Now, some of you may have, uh, if you've been paying attention, spotted a couple of weeks ago, the UK launched its white paper on artificial intelligence quite a different approach. It's a principles-based approach. It's got five principles. Uh, I'll read them out to you, but you don't need to take notes. It's all on a website somewhere. Uh, so it's safety, security, uh, uh, robustness is the first. Transparency and explainability is the second. Fairness is the third. Uh, accountability and governance is the fourth. And then contestability and redress. Uh, so that, that's the sort of overall framework. And then what the UK has done is said, we're not going to have a new regulator. We're not going to have new legislation. We're going to ask every existing regulator to think about what this means in the context of what they do. And in my view, actually, it's conceptually far stronger than the EU approach. I rarely say this about the UK legislation, <laughs> actually, but here we are. Uh, and so we should give congratulations where it's due. Um, it's principles-based. And given that the technology is changing so quickly, Actually, it means that you can evolve your approach because you're applying principles as against saying, we decided X was dangerous, now we're finding it's not, uh, or vice versa. So there's that agility there, which I, I think is good. And then the point about existing regulators, uh, and I, I, you know, over the years, I've always recommended this to government because regulators have got domain knowledge. And what AI means and algorithms mean in healthcare is quite different to what it means in insurance, which is different, again, to transport. So I think that is actually the right approach. However, and there's always a however, you've got to see all this in the context, I think, of the deregulatory sort of subtext in the UK. So have regulators seen their budgets rise in recent years? For the most part, not. Organizations like the Health and Safety Executive have seen them plummet. 
Uh, they've been given no new money for this new kind of whole era of AI. Uh, so my worry is not that the policy is bad, it's whether it will be operationalized and enforced. Uh, and think about housing policy in the UK, right? I mean, as epitomized most awfully by Grenfell, we had all the building regulations, it's just that they weren't enforced properly. So, uh, you know, th this, this is my real fear. So I suppose what, I, what I'm saying is we need to put resource and invest properly into our regulators and also help bring them together so that they can think about where there are cross-cutting issues because there will be some as well as sort of domain-specific ones as well uh, and to, to, to spot if there are any gaps because that's the sort of danger of a kind of UK approach, uh, as, as it were. But I, I, I think, you know, the, the, the key issue underpinning what I'm saying is the technology evolves fast, but governance changes slowly. And how do you, how do you marry that up? And I think that's where the UK approach is, is actually sensible. One thing it misses out uh, on all of this, I think, is um, the power of the big tech companies. And that, you know, we talked about the alignment problem and if AI is here and trying to do what meets human public interest, actually, I think the real alignment problem is the, the tech companies and the investors. Where's the alignment with public need? Uh, if you think about what's driving them, obviously, kind of long-term profit motive, uh, so quite, quite often ego as well of some of these big players. Uh, where are the incentives for ethics, for safety, for public interest? And instead, we've got to kind of move fast, break... Uh, move fast and break things kind of mentality, as it were. So ha, ha, we've already seen this in the data space. Even pre-AI, we've got large technological companies owning lots of data, uh, which we've given them uh, in exchange for services. It's very hard for new companies to then break in because actually the, the value of the data is linking of data sets. I think that we're going to... How do we feel about that now with AI kind of taken up to that next level, concentration into just the small hands of few companies, as it were? Uh, and across all of these companies, we've seen really quite large cutbacks in their ethics teams over recent months as well. So do we have confidence in self-regulation? Uh, you can guess my answer there. But there's no easy solutions equally. You know, I, I'm sort of positing the problem. Probably the best tool is competition policy. Uh, now, competition policy was grew up in the period where it was really framed around prices uh our companies kind of gouging consumers for prices as it were uh, that framework uh breaks down when actually today so much more especially in this field is about data exchange because there's no price that you pay anymore uh, and so competition and regulatory frameworks i think need to wake up and sort of shift uh, around that and the, to, to its credit the competition markets authority is thinking uh, about all of those things can it be more robust? Can all of these competition authorities be much more robust about the acquisitions that these large companies are making? Because uh, you look at Amazon, it just bought Roomba. It's a lot of images of your house <laughs> in Roomba. Uh, and Amazon now has that. Uh, so you know, I think we need to think quite hard about w w what's going to be used, what's, what's being bought, and how will it be used. Uh, but breakups are pretty unlikely, I think, because the consumer benefit we get from all, all of these large things is precisely because they are able to kind of link things up. So that, that, that's the tension. So it's, not a, it's an imperfect solution. Some people are talking about government-owned alternatives. Hey, let's set up a government AI uh, to compete with all of this. I, I mean, I'm pretty skeptical. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, it's not clear to me that government's going to have the competence to do this, not got the money, not got the data, et cetera. So, you know, I, I don't think that's going to fly, um, but it's raised every now and again. The other thought that I, has kind of done the rounds, I think, is worth taking seriously, is should we think more about these large tech companies from a kind of almost as if they are utilities? So if you think about water or, you know, whatever our public utilities are, these are companies who can make profits, but they are highly regulated, uh, and seen as delivering public service and benefits. So if we took that kind of mentality to these tech companies, would we treat them in a slightly different way? Again, I say that with <laughs> the caveat that uh, Ofgem hasn't really shown itself to be able to handle prepayment meters. Ofwat hasn't really stopped the sewage. You know, and so so there's no, policy is imperfect, continuously imperfect. 
but th that's not to say that th some kinds of systems are not better than others and that this may be a good one. And I'll come back to this, but uh, I do think the changing kind of security imperatives, national security imperatives, do mean that technology policy is in a slightly different landscape to the one it was in a few years ago, and that may well change the way government... So uh, governments, in some ways, are quite hands-off about all of this, going, you know, free market, etc. but I think security policy might, might shift that uh, over time. Uh, let me turn to a few wider policy lenses, because AI policy isn't just about AI policy. The first thing is research policy. Uh, in the UK, I think about a third of companies that do AI in Europe are based in the UK. One of the reasons we have so many, we have such strength is because uh, we've got such talent and uh, such strength in our research base. And we lose that at our peril, but there's been a lot of uncertainty since Brexit. Uh, there's been one year funding cycles for quite a long time, all sorts of other things which have just that uncertainty, uh, whether we're part of Horizon Europe, uh, all of these things have made us less attractive to international uh, research talent. So uh, I think that's starting to shift a little bit, but probably uh, that message hasn't really got through to, to the punters yet. Uh, we've created a new department for science, innovation, and technology, which is a good step forward, just in signaling that this is something that uh, is valued at the, in the UK. But I think we need longer term uh, investment in research, uh, going well beyond the sort of usual treasury mindset of three-year cycles. We need to end the culture war against universities because it's not really great to come to the UK and find that you're at the featuring in the Sunday Telegraph front page every weekend or whatever it might be. How can we improve the visa regimes? Can we associate to Horizon Europe, which is starting to happen? This is this big uh, international uh, platform for research collaboration. And also, uh, with my British Academy hat on, kind of having a balanced approach to STEM and what we call SHAPE, social science, humanities, and arts, uh, because at the moment there's very much a sense of STEM is the answer, it's the silver bullet. Well, all the things I've been talking to you about, regulatory stuff, policy stuff, uh, these things take philosophy and law and sociology, uh, economics, and so on as well. So that's research policy. Uh, another area where I think we need to be looking at is technology policy more generally. Obviously, AI is one component of that. Uh, and here, I'd say that the key point is that often we're focused on the shiny and the new. So it's quantum, it's AI, you know, it's all these things. What you've got to remember is that technology really is only as good as the adoption and diffusion. If people aren't using technology, who cares, right? research we did at the British Academy, there's one in five people living in households earning less than 25K a year who never use the internet. Uh, and that rises to nearly a third of disabled people in those households and nearly half of those age 65 and over. Uh, so there's a whole swathe of people who, you're talking about AI, but they're digitally excluded. Similarly, one in four UK businesses uh, don't have, haven't adopted basic IC, ICT uh, practices yet information technology practices. So if that's the case, you know, th there's a whole set of organizations that are excluded, and we need to think about take up as much as we think about the investment in the shiny and the new. You can see it with, you know, let's create electric cars and trucks, but therefore you have to invest in infrastructure around it, as it were. There's no point having one of those if you can't get it charged. Let's all uh, have heat pumps in our houses. Oh, but there are no engineers that can install these things. So there's no one-shot technology. You've got to have a whole ecosystem around it uh, for take-up and diffusion. Another area which I think we need to pay attention to is education policy. I mentioned earlier the UK's got weak productivity. Uh, AI won't magically solve this because it takes more than uh, technology. It may help, but you've got to have skills. You've got to have infrastructure. Uh, and I think here there's just a very strong argument to say, given the changing future we're living in, we need to invest more in human capital as a country. And it's been surprising to me how little post-pandemic we have invested in schools, despite the kind of uh, difficulties that they've had. Uh, and in particular, I think um, we need to strengthen lifelong learning, because if the world of work is going to change and we're going to have to retrain, we need to take that much more seriously. But uh, further education is still the Cinderella of the education system. If you look between 2010 and 20. 20, in that decade, we saw real-term funding cuts of about 10% to that sector. 
which is not really gearing us, uh, us up for the brave new world that I think we all need to uh, inhabit. So back on automation, history, tends to sh history shows that we tend to get new jobs when old jobs are destroyed or changed. But of course, all of us need to be supported in that transition, transition through it. So that's why I think education policy will be really important. And then I wanted to bang on about data policy. Uh, so data policy is neglected for its sexy cousin AI policy. Data policy is really boring compared to AI policy, you know. So, but we need to create a world, I think, where data is neither held so tight that it can never be used, but nor is kind of an absolute free for all for anyone to use. And you know, AI policy relies on data policy. Uh, you can't really have AI without strong kind of uh, ability to use data. There's various components to this, and I'll just touch on a few. One is data protection. And again, everything's happening. The data protection new bill in the UK is just going through its second reading. We're seeing a slight weakening of protections compared to GDPR, the, uh, the European approach. And again, I think this can probably be seen in the kind of deregulatory push. There's very much a sense of the UK wanting to try and to find some Brexit benefits. Uh, they're quite hard to find. And, and also, it's not clear that um, making these moderate changes will generate growth in the end, because companies have just got used to GDPR and to have minor changes. Even if they help you at the margin, there's also a cost in terms of implementation and relearning what to do. And if you work across borders, then you've got to have one regime here and one regime here. So it's not clear to me that, um, that the, the way we're going in data protection is going to be very helpful, not, not to mention that just watering down people's protections in the workplace, et cetera, is, is not necessarily a good thing. Um, we are, I think, bring, bring your popcorn for the general fight between AI and data protection, which is happening. We're seeing it play out in lots of places. Data protection and copyright together, I suppose. There's, uh, Italy has banned chat GPT because it, they've said they think on balance it probably breaches GDPR. And they've asked for uh, information about kind of where did the data get trained and so on. Uh, OpenAI, I think, are having to, to respond to that. Getty Images is suing Stability AI, which is a kind of image making company, uh, saying we don't think that you paid for our images when you when you use them to train your AI. And Universal Music has just told all of the. Uh, uh, the, the, the music networks, streaming services, to block AI from scraping lyrics and data because they don't want to give that away for free until they, uh, the artificial intelligence companies pay uh, for the license fees, as it were. I mean, in my view, um, the data protection copyright people will win in the end. Uh, the AI, probably quite a few AI companies have taken the kind of approach of, you know, do something first, break it, ask for permission later. I think it's going to come back and bite them because there are enough people here, enough people who can who can sue, uh, and will be able to to reclaim uh, some funding. This also does strengthen companies. It comes back to my earlier point: strengthen companies who have their own data sets, uh, and hence it actually this starts to explain why companies are buying vacuum cleaners or whatever things which already come with a pre-prepared data set are incredibly valuable. And so I suppose actually st stepping back from the data protection bit, we at, in the UK need to start thinking about data as infrastructure much more. We, we know about physical infrastructure, uh, but data is now really an infrastructure in all of our lives, including within public policy. Um, and that includes thinking about how we value our data, partly so we can protect it. I, I mean, there was the point you might remember a few years ago where one of the hospital trusts more or less gave away their data to DeepMind. And there was a big furore, and in the end, they had to sort of step back from this. Um, but it's partly because we didn't know how valuable that data is, and the public sector sometimes doesn't understand that. So procurement officers actually are at the kind of front line of defending uh, the value of UK data. The Treasury, as always, doesn't help in this case because their green book says the way you value data is its present value rather than its potential value. Uh, and so, but you know, you've got to think about the potential value because the value of data comes from linking. So we need, to, I think, a much more open-minded way of thinking about the value of data within the UK. And conversely, how can we open up both government data and uh, private sector data much more for research purposes? 
you know, if we want to understand what's going on in the world, it's now the private sector that's got the best data sets. Uh, and Twitter has just started locking down. For example, it used to be quite good at letting researchers access data. Now there's a hefty license fee that you have to pay. So can we start opening that back up again? Uh, and I wonder whether we can resurrect this notion of the data commons. I mean, the data is ours in the kind of broadest sense because it, it's about us. We gave it to those companies in some form or another. Um, you know, is there a way of imposing some kind of intellectual property license on the company saying, right, you, you got it in fair exchange, but you can have it for 10 years afterwards. It will go into a kind of tr trust non-profit body. We then have access to that as a collective, uh, as a commons, which can be used uh, for research and other purposes, as it were. Uh, and coming back to my point about technology companies and too much power, in the shadowy world of data, the, the shadowy data brokers who every time you click on anything uh, that they're they're linking that back up with other things and you might be categorized as you know uh, recent widower who likes gambling or whatever it might be I mean, the level of information that is held on us I think is, is is quite extraordinary the other thing I want to talk about on data and this is just one example is uh, in the space of public services and how we really don't know enough about basic things that are going on in society and uh, I want to talk about the justice system. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a, a trustee of the Legal Education Foundation. Our, what our work is about how we can improve the justice system, and we've been spending a lot of time looking at justice data. Uh, and successive reviews have shown that essentially justice is a bit of a data desert. Uh, we don't know how many judges sat during COVID. Uh, we don't know how many remote ha uh, hearings happened during that time. Uh, we don't have the data on outcomes of decisions made in family courts, uh, 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 you know, what happened next. So uh, the CEO of the Family Justice Observatory described it as surgeons, as like, it was like surgeons deciding never to find out how their operations went. Uh, that's kind of how it feels in the justice system. We've got massive uh, case backload at the, uh, backlog at the moment. The justice system is sort of keeling over, but we've got no idea what works in terms of trying to tackle these things. So. All, from all the way from kind of operational data to outcomes data, it's just very, very weak. Uh, and, you know, as I say, politicians are off chasing AI, but actually just what happens in our basic public services is just not there. So I would really want us to sort of keep our eye on that. A recent uh, Centre for Public Data report that we funded through the Legal Education Foundation picked four areas where it's a real priority to get justice data. So remand and bail, sentencing, court operations, and low-level offending were areas where we just don't have the quality of data that we need and could make a real difference. Uh, but the court system is about to be digitized, and if we bake it in from the start and say, this is what we want, this is the data that we want, this is what will make it uh, better for us to run public services, uh, we could do that. As always, I think you've got to think about data governance. So again, it's not a free-for-all. This data is, it, it, it is sort of handled in a way that, um, you know, especially when it comes to family uh, courts, etc., is handled in a really good way. So uh, that, that, that's, that's my banging the drum for data policy rather than AI policy. Let me just touch a bit on AI in policy, because I'm taking the justice system as, as an example. Uh, Narendra Modi last week, I think, said, let's start using AI in the court system. And <laughs> uh, when you talk to policymakers, for the most part, unless they really know their stuff, my, my reading is they think of AI as magic. And actually, this is why anthropologists are quite important in all of this. Again, you know, we've got lots of computer scientists, and we need more anthropologists saying, people see this as a religion, right? <laughs> um, and that then makes it very easy for policymakers to be sold products by snake oil salespeople, in particular when public finances are under pressure and you've got to get a solution to whatever it is you're trying to deliver. If you look at where automated decision making is already being rolled out, this is not necessarily AI, but kind of algorithmic solutions, it's often where people are the most vulnerable, where they're the most marginalized. In the UK, you can see it, for example, in settled status decisions or in universal credit decisions. Uh, and so it's often people at that end of things who are uh, at the sharp end of uh, algorithmic decision making. Now, I recognize human judgment is not infallible. And I think we do need to set a fair test for algorithms versus human judgment. And that is something we need to keep working on, because there are definitely times where 
human judgment is all over the place. We know there's a lot of literature on human biases, etc. So this is, I'm not saying we need to treat algorithms to a different standard to humans, as it were. And in some ways, actually, hopefully, the conversation about algorithmic decision making also then opens up a conversation about where are human decisions biased as well. But I would say, got to be very, very careful about rolling out uh, AI algorithmic systems for decision making in high, sta high stakes policy areas. Uh, you know, fine, automate how you do your timetabling of your, you know, whatever it might be, uh, but don't decide who gets a job or uh, who gets a, a benefit, etc., uh, with, without thinking very, very carefully. Uh, and, and to pick a couple of examples where the public really get quite annoyed about this, if you do it, uh, the post office scandal, which was not about uh, AI at all, but you know, here was the computer saying these people had stolen money and they hadn't, uh, and was just uh, frankly the biggest scandal I think uh, in UK public life in, in many many years. And then more recently, you'll remember the exams grading algorithm uh, a few years ago, where people got very very annoyed. So policymakers are not only going to do the wrong thing if they do it, but they will face, I think, public uh, real pressure uh, if, if you start rolling out these systems, as it were. And the flip side, I think, is that this is where accountability really matters. Uh, we don't want to be at the end of some opaque decision making where we can't tell why we've got the result that we did. So I think you've got to be able to monitor outcomes on different groups. Uh, you've got to have a right to explanation and redress. Uh, and funnily enough, these are all the things that were in the AI white paper. So again, to give it its credit, I do think that the kind of what, what the AI white paper in the UK says is broadly right. Whether it will be implemented will be a, a different question. I'm coming towards the end, but the final kind of policy thing I want to talk about was the kind of wider geopolitical and security lens on all of this. So the UK is a mid-sized power, uh, and so we can't do things in isolation. And in fact, one reading of the way we're doing policy at the moment is that we've had to take the EU approach on data protection, more or less, and we've got to take the US approach on security, by which I mean, for example, are we allowed to use Chinese technology, uh, telecoms infrastructure, for example? We're, we're just not big enough to set the terms of trade on policy, as it were. So it would be interesting to see how, for example, the UK approach on AI and the European approach might converge or diverge over time. My own instinct is that we might find, uh, I, I mentioned that the, the European approach was sort of moving away from its original kind of, this is a high risk technology, this is a low risk one, to saying it's the context of how it's used our principles might end us up in the same place, especially because companies working across both will say, come on, <laughs> you can't do one thing in one and one thing in the other. So I, I, we might see convergence. The other thing I could see us trying to do is deliberately plotting a different approach from the EU with a view to trying to convert the US to take that approach up. Because I think the US is slightly stuck at the moment where they kind of have a feel that they've, it's been very, cons very much about whatever's cheap, kind of slight wild west, they're probably open to a new approach, but they don't want the kind of GDPR European high regulation. So if the UK were able to put, I mean, I think that would probably be a diplomatic success if the UK could pull it off, but you know, let, 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 let's see if that, how that plays out. But as I mentioned earlier, security policy, I think, is really taking a far greater interest in this whole agenda, uh, more so than it ever has. Um, you have to just see how TikTok is being handled in the US at the moment. Uh, but that, that's happening more and more and more. And I suppose this is where, I, I mean, I'm really, this is me pontificating or just absolutely guessing. But my, my own instinct is that um, that division that we've seen in the Western world between the kind of governments and private sector will start to dissolve in a way that we've already seen in China much more. And it wouldn't surprise me, uh, well, uh, that could play out in different ways. So you've got the online safety bill at the moment where there's a bit of a tussle between kind of WhatsApp and Signal and so on saying, we're all about privacy for the end user. And the government is saying, no, we want you to open up because if crimes are being committed through what you're doing, we want to kind of pierce the veil of the privacy, as it were. That's one. We might see greater regulation of the sort that I've been talking about, perhaps sort of how do you treat these companies as utilities. Um, I just wouldn't be surprised, and this is very speculative, if in five years' time some of these companies weren't just taken over outright by government, uh, by governments. Uh, it may not be the UK government, 
But on the grounds of national security, you could see governments going, hang on, that's a fancy bit of technology you've got there. Uh, why have you got it? <laughs> so uh, as I say, that's probably the most speculative thing in my talk, but I did want to put it out there because I, I just can't, in, in the world that we're living, if people have that level of powerful technology, I just can't see how governments are going to let them ha have that in their own kind of private sector hands. Anyway, that, that's my sort of general tour. I, I'm going to start ending now. Uh, some wider reflections, I suppose. A, a problem with the kind of discussion about AI is we often start with the technology. And it's all about what are we going to do? How are we going to adapt? And I'd like to sort of flip that on its head and say we should be starting by saying, what's, don't let the technology drive the conversation. What's the world we're trying to create? Uh, and be driven by that. And then the question is how, is, how are we going to use AI and the technology to get us to that world? And you might get different answers from if you just say, here's AI, what are we going to do, what are we going to do about it? Um, I do think this is where disciplines at the British Academy have a really important role to play. You need to be talking to novelists, philosophers, lawyers, anthropologists, economists, sociologists, and so on, alongside the, the sort of technical people as well. Uh, you might ask me, what, what has Greek tragedy got to add to the AI debate? And I would say Icarus. Uh, so <laughs> Technology needs a public license to operate. Um, and politically, it can be tempting to sort of sidestep that and say, look, hey, don't worry, we've got it under control. You know, we're very clever people. We, we, we know what we're doing. And of course, we did that with the banking <laughs> system back in the early 2000s. Uh, and, and that didn't quite work. So I think there's a real risk there. We saw it in some ways with GM foods back in the 1990s, where Europe really pushed back because they didn't trust GM foods, uh, despite, I think, all the scientific evidence suggesting that, 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 that they were you know, safe. Um, so it does seem to me that if you're to maintain that public license, you've got to engage with the public. Um, and a different example we saw a few years ago was the way that the NHS was trying to uh, or the government was trying to create care.data to share health data information within uh, UK government, didn't really take the public on board. Uh, I think they even failed to send the information commissioner the leaflet about it. Uh, and so there was an enormous backlash and the whole thing fell apart. Despite, again, it was kind of good intentions, probably something that many people would have actually supported, as it were. Part of that, 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 therefore, I think, is that the job is how do we create a trustworthy system? If you are buying food or getting a medicine, you don't have to make your own evaluation as to whether this thing is safe or not. You know that there's a whole system behind it which has been through a kind of series of steps. You don't even know, necessarily need to know what they all are, but that you trust, which has kept all of this safe. And I think the question for me is how do we create similar adequate systems which we can trust uh, as citizens uh, for AI. And in terms of involving the public, especially where we don't know what the answer is, I think you know deliberative fora are really helpful. So when I was at the Ada Lovelace Institute, we set up, for example, a Citizens Biometrics Council. So this was to look at things like facial recognition, voice recognition technologies, all of which are evolving very fast. And no one's got a template on how, how, how we should respond. We took 50 members of the public. We held workshops for several weekends uh, over the course of many months, gave them expert advice uh, and input where they could question people. And as a result, you get what, a much more informed public view of where people see the lines. So they, for example, were calling for an oversight body for biometrics. There's been a recent exercise with young people called the Digital Futures Commission, uh, which was led by one of the fellows at the British Academy, uh, Sonia Livingston, all about children's voices in digital futures. Uh, and the thing is, sometimes the public will tell you things that you as kind of the very well-meaning expert would just not be very interested in. So the children said, we'd like fewer adverts, please. Uh, and I don't think any policy kind of wonk person would have cared or thought about that, as it were. But it's really important that we allow those voices to speak. And I think given that the technology will continue to evolve at a fast rate, I think it's important that we're doing these sorts of things on an ongoing basis. So I'm finally coming to the end. Yes, really. <laughs> I can't quite sum up, but AI, I think, the hype around it means it's quite hard to think clearly. 
I hope I've tried to lay out my thoughts in a sort of clear fashion, uh, and I hope that's provided a bit of clarity. Let's not let technology drive the shape of our society. We don't have to adapt to the technology. It can adapt to what we want it to do. I think the UK's regulatory approach is conceptually sound uh, and agile, but it needs investment if, if it's going to work. Um, and because we can't predict how the technology will play out, uh, a lot of the focus is on the tech, but actually, who knew Facebook would break democracy? Again, I caricature, but you know, uh, these things will be used in different ways, and therefore, we'll, we, we're constantly going to be managing the side effects of things that we did not expect. Uh, and therefore, that kind of agile regulatory response, I think, is really important. I've said we need to think about AI policy in a much wider set of policy contexts, including competition, education, technology, research, and data. Uh, and the ultimate aim, as I say, is to build some kind of trustworthy system, which needs to keep evolving. So you need deliberative inquiry, you need research, you need regulatory thinking and rethinking. Well, it's never going to stop, I'm afraid, but I think that there is a way of, of doing it. Uh, and I suppose my, fi my final point is the future is not set, right? Uh, you can imagine a kind of dystopic future, wealth concentrating in fewer hands, uh, low quality work where your surveillance is kind of always on in your workplace, your keyboard is being checked for how many times you've tapped, etc. Technology primarily being used against the public interest by private hands. You always feel every time you buy something like you've just been squeezed by some AI that kind of knew exactly how much you were willing to pay and it kind of put you absolutely against the, uh, the wall. And people feeling powerless in the face of kind of on ongoing technological change. And you know you've, we've seen where people feeling powerless gets you, right, uh, in political terms. Or there is a kind of opposite, more positive set of futures, one of shared prosperity, greater productivity, possibly more time uh, if, uh, if we decide to take growing prosperity in those terms, and the public feeling much more in control. And we can, I think, collectively shape which direction we go in. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have uh, a long list of questions because you touched on so many different topics, but I'm not going to ask the questions myself. I am going to go to, to the audience to see if there are questions. There's one here first. Um, thanks, Heaton. My name's Susie Madigan. Um, I come from a humanitarian aid agency, Care International, uh, and I also write a blog series called The Machine Race. So I was very happy, um, which is all about uh, looking at AI and society and rights. So I was very happy to hear about you talking about the need for inter interdisciplinary uh, approaches to this. Um, I guess my question for you is to with regards to the hype that is happening in this space, which you've touched on, particularly online, and that's where a lot of these arguments are happening, and a lot of this um, kind of hyperbolic debate is actually happening within the tech sector itself. How do we bring the public into bringing, really engaging with this and still taking that kind of pressure to put pressure on governments and the tech sector um, to regulate, to rein things in. And I guess where, where I would be coming at from this, I, I understand the frustration with the open letter, but at the same time, if I come at that from a humanitarian protection of civilians perspective, there are certain you know, existential, I'm, I'm just back from Ukraine a couple of days ago, there are certain existential risks that affect absolutely everybody. They may not happen, but it's important to think about them. And then there are the specific risks that might impact just certain types of people. Um, so, how, so, so how do we bring people into those nuanced conversations, um, create the funding, the spaces, to, to allow that public conversation to happen and that pressure still to remain. Thanks. Thank before, we, before, we, before we take an answer, I'm just going to see if there are one or two other questions that we can bring into the, into the mix as well. That was a, there are lots of things in that question. Hi there. Thanks a lot for your talk. 
Um, I'm, I'm a student of AI ethics from Cambridge, and uh, my research is focused on governance mechanisms for AI in the public sector, in local governments. So I read a paper of yours from 2018. It's called Algorithmic Accountability, and I was quite inspired by what you said then, that um, you know, public sector organizations should be more confident in negotiating terms with the private sector. So I was just wondering how, or if any, if your views evolved since then and how, and if you were to advise a public organization on how to negotiate the terms, what would be your recommendations? Thank you. Is there one last question? We'll take it for we. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the part where you talk about data commons, and I wanted to ask you if you have any thoughts on uh, specifically how these data commons, or how this commons initiative and, and the, 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 the public realm has been also captured in a sense, and how to prevent from that from happening again uh, in the sense. So I'm thinking a specific example of uh, ImageNet, for example, that benefited from uh, Creative Commons licenses in order to then be, you know, privatize those the profits that that, that, that came from that, and at the same time uh, socialize the risks and the costs. No? Great, thank you. Great set of questions. Uh, I mean, you asked many questions, and I probably <laughs> need another lecture to, to get through them all. But I suppose on the on the kind of question of how do you bring the public in, it feels to me really important that philanthropists and governments put money into this because a lot of the initiatives that are looking at technology are funded by technology companies themselves. It's quite hard. One of the reasons I helped found the Ada Lovelace Institute and we took it to the Nuffield Foundation in the UK was because we wanted something that was uncontaminated by those vested interests, as it were. Not to say they can't be helpful, but just in the ecosystem, you need organizations that come from a sort of civil society background. And, you know, you're from the civil society world. There are still not that many organizations in the civil society space that have confidence in technology, know how to, and this is, this is tough stuff. And, you know, all of us that work in that space, we've probably taken a pay cut from what you could be earning in the private sector. How do you get people with that data science expertise, et cetera, to actually come and advise? So uh, again, when I was at the Royal Statistical Society, I created a, a statisticians for society, getting data scientists to volunteer on boards of charities, et cetera. So, creating some of those networking effects. But the funding is key, and philanthropic bodies, for the most part, are slightly behind the curve on all of this. So I think that, that, that that's really important. Uh, on, uh, uh, on algorithmic accountability, that, that was a paper I actually did write, not just one made up by ChatGPT, so I'm very <laughs> grateful to you for mentioning it. Um, it doesn't feel to me that things have moved on a great deal. I think that... Um, the UK government is now just finally starting to think where are its data assets? And I think that's probably the starting point in a way that if it can map out where are the most valuable data sets that the UK owns, it then provides, I think, a space for those people who then might be doing procurement deals with that data to actually have some kind of bargaining chip, as it were. You know, if you want to value a data set, the best way is to use an auction, but actually, <laughs> That's very hard to do in these cases, as it were, because there are only one or two buyers in the market. Um, so we, we will have to, I think, find alternative ways of trying to value those data sets, which would then be able to give people that kind of sense of confidence in, in those negotiations, as it were. And on this issue of the data commons, um, it's, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, OpenAI itself also started off as a, as a not-for-profit organization and shifted and I don't know enough of the history to know exactly what drove that, but one can see that there are probably a mixture of imperatives, sometimes a for-profit imperative, but also there's something about bringing in investment uh, as well. Uh, and I think this is the worry about all of and the data commons thing. So the, the idea I gave was, OK, what if there was a kind of IP license around some of the data that the private sector organizations hold that then moves into a sort of commons entity in the future? The issue will be who is then funding that entity uh, and keeping it alive. Now, hopefully, it could do it through its own revenue streams because of that, uh, you know, the value of the data that it holds. Um, it, if, that, if that can be pulled off, you can create it in such a structure that it can't, you know, I mean, there, there are things like community interest companies in the UK where you, you can't, it's a charitable structure, in effect, where you can't break out and you've got to always be working for public benefit. You can't shift into a shareholder mode. So I think those structures are there, but you'd need to feel confident that there was a business model that would keep the thing underpinned. I'm going to 
Yeah, and wherever there's over time, we're going to try and take another round. There's one here at the front, then one over there, and then back here. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm Elena Simpel, a professor of computer science here, um, and I'm also the director of research at the Open Data Institute. Um, so I'm going to go back to what you said about um, government AI, and you I understand why that idea might seem easy to dismiss. Uh, I'm thinking about when Germany and France wanted to set up the German-French uh, search engine to compete with Google, and we all know how, how that went. Um, at the same time, I wonder what would be, going back to what you just said about open AI and them going um, corporate because of investment pressures possibly, what are alternative sort of public-private mechanisms to fund key pieces of the infrastructure, whether it's the canonical data sets that you use to train um, uh, core algorithms, whether it's deploying some of these models in an environment where you can audit and assess them. Do you have any thoughts about, about that? Just for easy, so I'm coming back to the back, let's try one here first. Thanks. Hi, um, thanks for the talk and thanks for the reminder that tech and AI are here to serve us, society, rather than the other way around. Um, Anusha Panjwani, I'm the head of science of the European Corporation in Brussels. Um, I'm interested in trying to understand from a policy uh, design, co-design point of view, is it a good idea to use AI at the stage where policy is being designed or at the and or at the evaluation stage? And a related question to this is, should or can AI be used to validate a proposed policy solution or to propose the policy solution? Thanks. And then the last couple at the back. Hi, thank you for the talk, um, really interesting. I, I'm Roman Karmata, I oversee the governance and ethics of the AI Centre for Value-Based Healthcare. And working in the, the medical AI space, there's quite a bit more regulation than the other spaces, which is great, it makes me feel quite safe. But then I think about the other areas which don't have that and the UK's approach to it, and it makes me a bit nervous. So using AI in, um, for hiring, uh, you, you could say the ICO would have some kind of oversight, but not really in a discriminatory context. At the best, you'd have the Equality Act, which is quite hard to enforce. So look, the question I'm leading to is, what kind of guardrail should be in place for these, these gaps between regulators? We haven't really seen much in the DCIP papers. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Patrick Joyce, I'm a lawyer, so of course I'm going to go back to AI and justice. Uh, you spoke about algorithmic decision-making. Uh, in a sense, we have that through ODR and PayPal and um, eBay, where some justice is better than no justice. But I do wonder whether we're missing a trick, and we should really be focusing on algorithmic decision assistance, so that, um, leaving aside crime, leaving aside family, but in a commercial environment, two commercial entities can use AI predictively thereby narrow down the zone of possible agreement much more quickly than can be done without AI, and then go to mediation, uh, this is a point against self-interest because it then cuts out lawyers and um, prefers mediators. Great. Well, thanks. Great set of questions here. Uh, so public-private mechanisms to fund key data sets and infrastructure is called tax, in my view. Uh, <laughs> I mean, let's keep it simple where we can. I mean, let, let's, let's think about taxation and what we want to spend taxation on to, to create. So it, and that, that's why I was saying let's think about data as infrastructure, and therefore it's a core role of government, as it were, rather than creating some sort of piddly thing that we, which is very costly to then create in terms of a partnership. Um, do we use AI at design or evaluation, proposal, validation. I, I think it's quite early to tell in a way. Um, and this is probably where, if you come back to my view, that AI is largely pattern-generated, predictive text kind of stuff, um, it's probably more useful for first draft inspiration. Give, give me some ideas. How do other countries do this? Kind of a super search engine which may be hallucinating sometimes, so you need to <laughs> validate it in other ways. How good it is as a tool for evaluation uh, or um, validation, I, I'm not convinced yet, but I, I suspect people will create tools which will help that to happen. 
that's where I was saying you need the data, because if you've got high quality data, then the AI can sort of li li link some of that up. Um, guardrails between regulators is a good question. And I think that, that buried in the AI white paper is this notion of a central government risk function. And I think that's sort of how it's dealt with. It, it may or may not <laughs> work. Um, I suppose that's where I was saying in the absence of anything kind of centralized, this is where bringing the regulators together, creating a sort of network or something, probably, I mean, there are, there are almost so many bodies now. There's the AI Council, there's the Department of Science, Innovation, Technology, you know, all sorts of things. Somebody could take the lead. I would have thought the new ta National Technology Advisor would be well placed to do it. So this is a role that Patrick Valance was doing as a combined role with Chief Scientific Advisor. Now that he's left, they've split it separately, which is a good thing. Uh, so this new person will be coming in and hopefully could t take a hold of that. But yeah, uh, everywhere is nowhere. So, <laughs> uh, and on your point about algorithmic uh, uh, decision assistance, I think that's great. And I suspect all these sorts of things I think will come on board, especially where, as you say, it's commercial, it's kind of, two private entities doing deals, this is exactly the sort of thing some, some AI, some trainee lawyer who hates being a lawyer but now understands it will go off and set up a startup to kind of swipe your business, you know. <laughs> Maybe you should do it. Uh, yeah. It's, a, it's been a very hot, hot, warm room, but it's been worth it, I will say. Um, I will just say that, uh, to finish, there were a number of really interesting issues there around and not just things like algorithmic decision making, but also explainability, transparency, uh, AI and justice. These are really interesting fundamental questions which are also being explored in the exhibition that will take place <laughs> in the Bush House Arcade starting from the 3rd of May going through to the 30th of June. And with that, I will say thank you for raising the issues. Uh, uh, it's been a fascinating hour. Um, please all join me in thanking our guest, Ora Pantana. Fascinating. <laughs> And maybe we can bring you back sometime. <laughs> <laughs>